guess what I'm talking about is the fact that often we're, we're led to think about culture as this kind of monolithic structure, um, singular and massive. And, you know, people, I'm sure this applies also in the world of filmmaking or, or architecture. You know, there's a kind of sense that in order to be, to play a kind of uh, a valid and active role within that structure, you've kind of got to know the whole thing. Um, you've got to know everybody and see all the exhibitions and have an opinion on every single kind of granular detail uh, of that kind of monolithic structure. Um, and, but the truth is that that's just a completely impossible proposition. Um, and actually, we all, we're all individuals and we carry around our own little kind of social, um, social and professional networks and they kind of move around with us as we go and they're kind of fluid and porous and sometimes they overlap. Uh, you know, it's curious that, you know, my cultural world and your cultural world obviously overlap a, a little bit because we we've discovered we've got some mutual kind of friends and acquaintances. Um, but we don't occupy the same sort of uh, part of the kind of cultural arena. Uh, so I, I guess that's what I was sort of getting at really, this sense that it's, it's a very individual thing. It's not this kind of monolithic <clears throat> thing you know so i think i was saying to you you know people often i have conversations and someone says you know do you know x expecting that i will know x because i work in this thing we're calling the art world and when i say no i don't know x so like somehow disappointed <laughs> because they think i should know x but i don't um and that's fine i like you know i do it would be impossible to know everybody and it, you know i know too many people already so <laughs> yeah. yeah so that, that's that's what i was getting at i suppose um, so within within that understanding that there isn't um a kind of monolithic structure what how would you define the structure that you occupy or the area of that kind of more fluid yeah. world? Yeah, I suppose, um, again, it's kind of fluid and it's always changing um, depending on, I mean, even day to day. Um, you know, I'm right now, I'm here in the gallery and, you know, the gallery is the center of a network of professional and social relations, um, you know, and that some of those networks are about artists and their work, and other networks are about curators and their interest in certain artists and things. So, so right now, I'm, I, this is, I'm occupying this part of my personal art world, but on another day, I might be, um, you know, doing a studio visit with an artist whose work I, I'm interested in, but I've never met. And so that's two different kind of uh, little networks thing coming together and connecting. Um, yeah. What's interesting maybe in your trajectory is that um, you've gone from an institutional framework to what I guess we can now call a more of a commercial uh, environment. So when, if we try to draw a, a sort of a, a, a boundary or some kind of area type um, topographical drawing of your art world, there is, there is also some, there is also that relationship between a um, institutional and the maybe commercial and and how how did those things uh, talk to each other well i think that they've always been very fluid there's always mm -hmm. been a kind of gray area um although the kind of popular perception is that they are quite separate um 
And I think when I when I was a curator at the Tate, I felt that they were separate things. And when I moved uh, crossed over that boundary into the commercial world, at that moment I felt that they were quite separate things. But as I've you know, that was a long time ago now. And in the last decade, I think, I don't really think of them in those terms anymore. Um, it's, all, it's all just facets of, um, you know, it's, it's a cultural endeavor um, that has these different facets to it. So, Yes, the gallery is a commercial structure. We have to sell art in order to pay the rent and in order for the artists to pay the rent on their studios and so on. But um, we, we're often working with museum curators, whether that's um, helping with projects, and that, that might be very practical help, or it might be curatorial kind of inputs. Um, and I, I kind of think it all just flows together, actually. It's, um, I think my, my perceptions of these things, it's all become a lot more, a lot looser as I've got older. Um, and in terms, of, yeah. in terms of opportunities within these different structures, say uh, institutional or commercial, though maybe the commercial we could also call more of a kind of independent curatorial project right yeah it's uh it's also in a sense a curatorial project that isn't linked to a kind of board of some kind of governors or no i mean we want the, the amazing thing about working in this context is the freedom that we have um you know, I, I found it really extraordinary when I when I left the tapes and joined Fontra Benison. Um, you know, I was very I was very nervous at first, but there was this kind of extraordinary sense of liberation because within a big institution like that, um, projects can take many years to go from you know from their first first genesis to actually opening to the public. Um, and of course that, you know, there's a good reason for that and often it means that there's time to do the really kind of the, the deep research that needs to happen. But the flip side is uh, sometimes it just get, it can get popped down and the energy seeps out of a project. Whereas in this context, you know, we, some, we can have an idea and, and just do it. Um, you know, and some, and some sort of thing, well, you know, wouldn't it be great to kind of have the luxury of spending two, two years researching a, a show and, you know, making it, um, making it as perfect as it can possibly be. But, you know, on the other hand, it's wonderful to be able to kind of move quickly and be a little bit intuitive and responsive and, you know, as a, for, as a curator, and I, I do still think of myself as a curator, even though, you know, I, I have to wear lots of different hats at the gallery, including, you know, salesman and manager and all that, you know, but primarily I think of myself as a curator. Um, and yeah, it's great. It's wonderful. Freedom. <laughs> yeah. So in, in your curatorial project, which is Paraffin Gallery, obviously there is a kind of business side to it. And there is, there is an element of audience I, which isn't just the audience but it's also the clients and so so how do you so when you look at your audience how do you distinguish the client from the audience from the person that comes to enjoy the work yeah that's a that's a really interesting question um because i mean i guess really from a business point of view anyone who walks through the door is potentially a client um, but I think the way that we think about our audience is primarily that they are, you know, it's an audience, it's people who come here to engage with our artworks. Um, we're, yes, it's a commercial 
proposition, but it's also a cultural platform. It's a platform for culture. Um, so, um, yes, sales happen, but equally, you know, it's wonderful when people come to the gallery and you find yourself having conversations, they've discovered a new artist and you're able to kind of really, um, you know, give them lots of information and new insights and things like that. Um, so do, yeah, so are they different constituents? Um, I suppose in a way they are, although we don't really think of it in those terms. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's curious. It's curious because it's almost um, it's almost that what you're saying is a kind of cultural dialogue that you need to generate, regardless of um, kind of being able to generate. Um, yeah, I mean, if it, or... if it was purely a commercial proposition, um, there wouldn't really be it wouldn't make sense to actually have a gallery. Um, you know, we could just have a website, put some paintings on there and offer them up for sale. And, you know, we wouldn't have all the overheads of, of this. Um, but we feel it's really important, you know, that the gallery can make a contribution to this wider cultural um, you know, discussion that the exhibitions can, um, you know, you can, you, but you can make substantial, um, ex, you can build experiences in, in, in the gallery, that an artist has a, an opportunity to make something that, you know, a full body of work and put it out there for the public to either engage with or ignore. Um, so, yeah, it's funny, I guess the commercial does drive the cultural, uh, but hopefully they're in a kind of, in a, in a... Constructive dialogue. Yes, exactly, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then when, when paraffin was established, you know, if, if you were to take a kind of uh, typical business lesson, of finding a USP and finding your place in the market and, um, you know, seeing what's missing and what is it that you can provide that's not there, but also being able to be profitable business, et cetera, et cetera, without turning this into a kind of a lesson on a, a kind of a business MBA type lesson. How, how did, how did paraffin form as a, curatorial project and as a kind of business project? Um, well, I guess, I guess it forms out of the sensibilities of the people who are involved. So particularly, you know, myself and Matt Watkins, my, um, my business partner, we, we used to, we worked together at Poncho Venice and we worked very closely. I was head of exhibitions, he was head of communications. So everything that we did was very kind of knitted together. And I think we, we kind of really share a sensibility in terms of the art that we really kind of love and respond to. So as a curatorial project, it sort of comes out of that. It's a sort of an expression of two personalities, perhaps, you could say. Um, and the business kind of builds on the back of that. You know? So we have to hope that there are people out there, you know, collectors, curators, and audience that find our sensibility interesting and that want to, you know, because they come to the gallery, they see a show and they think, this is interesting. I'll keep an eye out. I'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye on this this gallery's program because I think what they're doing, you know, connects to me in some way. Um, and it, it, it's always interesting when I mean, at the moment we can't do private views, unfortunately. But uh, pre-pandemic, when you open a show, you know, there's always this lovely moment where there's a gathering of people, and for every show, it's a different group of people. 
uh, because each artist has you know their different sort of audiences and their followers but there are there is a core group of people who kind of come again and again and again and you know it's it's one of the kind of most gratifying things for me is when i have a conversation with someone at one of these events and they sort of say wow you know i really i really like your program i've been following your program and i've discovered x and y and you know they're really great artists so that that to me says that we're doing something right you know but it does have a kind of it has something that runs through it that's, that is consistent even though it might be an abstract painter, a photographer, a conceptual artist, somehow they connect. And I think that probably also talks to that first question, the question of all these different worlds. So it's the sensibility that creates the yeah. that creates that world, right? To understand where that comes from, where your um, sense of what art is comes from and I very much enjoyed your uh, book of essays on land art and and one thing that I kind of kept wondering as I was as I was so, so going through it was whether you discovered art first or land art <laughs> first yeah uh, interesting um yeah, that's a really interesting question because, you know, the obvious answer is that I discovered art first, you know, as a kid when I started to enjoy looking at paintings and stuff like that. And then I found later on, you know, it, it took me a long time to kind of find my way and work out what I was really interested in. Um, and actually at the, at the tape, because I worked in the exhibitions department, I had this wonderful uh, you know, I would work on a Turner exhibition and then I would work on the Turner Prize exhibition. So I was kind of exposed to this incredible kind of history of art, you know. And, um, you know, it, it was a long time before I actually sort of got right, you know, this is where I want to kind of really zoom in and focus. But maybe actually kind of I had found land art before without realizing it because um I think I say something in the introduction to the book about you know growing having a rural childhood being interested in climbing mountains and stuff when I was younger um always being you know feeling a kind of engagement with landscape you know, so so maybe that was there already, and it was like, I mean, I do, I kind of had a sort of light bulb moment, I suppose, um, when I kind of really started to look at the work of artists like Hamish Fulton and Richard Long, and it just felt that that was speaking to me in a very, very kind of direct and wonderful way. Um, so. So yeah, you what, can turn that So what do you right? do? So what do you do when you when when you when the artwork is talking to you? What was your first instinct to kind of how do you how do you develop that relationship? Well then then, then, then you kind of you, you want to find out more, but you want to know more. So you start to you start to dig and do research and and um, you know and look look at you know trying to try to understand what, what what's going on um you know that's actually as a curator and a writer that's always been the kind of driving force actually you know what is going on you know how can i understand that um I've always found writing is a wonderful way of clarifying your position in relation to an artwork or an artist or, or whatever it is especially if you're writing for publication because you you know it's going to be out there and someone might come back and say hang on <laughs> someone might read <laughs> it <laughs> yeah. um, so you have to kind of you have to reach a point where you you, you clarify your thinking um so i think when when um you know when i had that moment it's like okay i need to now 
now I need to go to the library and get lots of books out and, and try and see as much of this art as I can because it really, it's exciting. You know, it's, so what? So when you had that moment, um, what were you engaged with in terms of art in your kind of curatorial practice? Well, as I say, I was at the Tate and I was working on lots and lots of different things. Um, I was in, involved in Turner Prize exhibitions. I was involved with the Art Now program, as it was then, um, which is a kind of young artist, emerging artist uh, strand um, of kind of projects. Um, and I was, I mean, I was kind of really at that point sort of broadly focused on what I suppose you would call post-war and contemporary British art. That was my kind of focus. So um, I worked as an organiser for a big Michael Andrews retrospective, um, things like that. Um, and then there was so the opportunity that... to work on it. Mm. So how does that, Sorry? what I'm trying to get to is, is how does that uh, experience, knowledge, bridge to the, to the, to all the land art, to land art. Is yeah. there, is there, a, is there a connection that, that it perhaps is a kind of, uh, a connection? Well, I, I suppose there is in that my, my kind of understanding of what land art is, really comes out of a specific British um, context. You know, so I, I begin my understanding with Richard Long and H. Fulton and went from there to seek out Robert Smithson and Walter de Maria and other artists. Um, and, you know, I kind of, when I, when I started to look into that, I saw that there'd been a sort of strange historical kind of imbalance in the way that this work had been discussed, you know, very much, you know, the Americans did these big, impressive things and, you know, big, bigger, bigger was better. And, you know, meanwhile, there's these little subtle things happening in, in England or in France or Italy or whatever. And it's kind of all a bit quiet and small and, it, but it's equally important, you know, you've got, just because something's bigger than something else doesn't mean it's more important. So, so initially I was kind of interested to kind of dig into that and try and understand why, why that had happened and, um, and to perhaps kind of redress that balance in, in a small way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the British context, I think, that is my way in, you know, so I was really interested in the fact that, you know, um, Richard and Hamish were at Martins and that's, that's their kind of formative moment. But that's also a kind of key moment in terms of painting in this country, you know. So the 60s is, you know, a decade of pop art and, you know, really kind of extraordinary kind of abstraction. And so, it's all kind of, again, we're coming back to this notion of different art worlds, you know, it's not all these things flow alongside each other. Um, so Lucian Freud's making an extraordinary portrait at the same moment that Richard Long is walking a line in the landscape. Um, but we don't tend to think of them as being historically kind of continuous. Uh, so I think that, that, that for me was really interesting, you know, trying to pick apart where it comes from. Um, did, so, so did you have a kind of uh, existential crisis um, where, you know, you're within this established institution and then you're exploring this new interest? How, how, how does within an institution an interest that perhaps isn't acknowledged by the institution, and I'm just speculating that it's not acknowledged because that's what I would assume. How does that work? Yeah, I, I mean, I think with, within the institution, you have to, 
you, you have to kind of um, sometimes you have to compromise. You know, your your interests perhaps don't align with the immediate kind of agenda that the institution is 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 pursuing. And I think, I think that's probably especially true in such a big institution like the Tate. Um, but actually, you know, it was possible to find ways to um, to kind of pursue that interest because, you know, as I said, I, I worked on with Hamish on his big exhibition at Tate Britain in 2002 or three, And then off the back of that, I was asked by Tate Publishing to write a kind of introduction to Landart for their sort of movements in art series. So, so then there, there was my kind of opportunity to actually, with the support of the institution, really kind of dig in and look at that kind of thing in a, in a, in a quite a broad way. Um, so, so actually, yeah, it did align, actually. Um, right. Um, you know, and I, I think often the institution is quite good at seeing where curators have particular interests and allowing them to develop a kind of um, a greater depth of knowledge because it all feeds into this kind of pool of knowledge it becomes a resource that the institution can can call on um, yeah. i mean i wasn't necessarily going to think about or talk about tate but i, I it, it might be interesting to reflect on so you're basically saying you were at Tate at the moment when Tate Modern was established? Yeah, so I, I joined the Tate Gallery, as it was then, uh, in, the, in the late 90s, in 1997 right. or something like that. And then there was this fascinating moment where, um, where one institution became two. Um, well, actually, became four because you have Liverpool and St. Ives. Um, so suddenly there was this, it, it turned into a very, very different kind of beast. <laughs> um, because presumably there is, a, there is suddenly a vent for so much art that wasn't addressed, not necessarily because the institute, but just spatially you couldn't. Uh, yeah, so suddenly, suddenly there's, like, like you say, suddenly there's a, the platform becomes a lot wider, you know, so, so just in terms of the displays, you can go in to a subject in much more detail than you yeah. were able to before. Um, yeah, it was, a really, it was a fascinating moment. So um, you were there in that sort of pivotal moment, that's interesting. <laughs> you were there in that kind of in that pivotal moment yeah yeah i mean i wasn't i wasn't in a senior position at all i was yes, yes, kind yes. of in a junior position but yeah so i wasn't i wasn't part of those the decision making process i was very much an observer um but it was it was a really really interesting time because there were lots of discussions about you know British art versus international art, and where the things sit, you know, um, and these conversations continue, of course. Um, yeah, but I think this is an important. This is actually quite an important conversation because the institution isn't just the um, the leadership that uh, you know may be publicly visible, but it's actually like you have this amazing body of young curators, which all have their own interests that probably, you know, at times clash or don't clash or... Yeah, and it, the other thing that was happening when I was there was that things were kind of loosening up a bit in terms of curatorial practice. Um, you know, so there were a lot of people, a lot of curators within the collections department, as it was there, uh, who, you know, been there for life, you know, and that... And of course, that's to be expected because if you're interested in British arts, and you're a specialist, then that's the place to be. Um, but I, I wasn't in the collections department, I was in the exhibitions department. Uh, but there was a kind of, things were starting to 
shift so that um, you know, as an exhibitions curator towards the end of my time there, I was also sitting on one of the acquisitions committees. So kind of feeding into conversations about the collection. Um, so, I mean, of course I can't really, you know, it's a long time since I was there, but uh, so I can't really comment on how things are in the last. Well, but you're now, you're now, you've now changed your perspective. You're now the audience yeah. to that. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so when you when you observe this, it's not this isn't necessarily what I wanted to ask, or it's not in my notes. But um, as an observer now of the cultural landscape of how institutions have evolved since you've left them, uh, what's your verdict? And and you know where? <laughs> and you know, I mean, of course, there'll be a period of recovery from the pandemic and yeah. um, where we're, everyone is challenged, but, but what's your, well, what's your kind of moment, isn't it? Not, not just in the visual arts, but for culture across the board, because there's so many, there are really, really kind of fundamental shifts happening. Um, you know, thinking about you know, Black Lives Matter and the climate crisis and there's so much happening in the, if the pandemic has only kind of pushed change forward. Um, so it's a really, really challenging moment for institutions, not just museums, but, you know, kind of theatres, cinemas, you know, culturally, this is a challenging moment. Um, but it's also a moment where possibilities are opening up. And that changes, changes happening. Um, so, yeah, it's really how 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 those institutions handle all that change. You know, as an observer, it's going to be a very interesting thing to follow. I think. I mean, what what, what do you think? How 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 is the world of architecture? Is uh, is is that shifting and changing as society is? kind of recalibrating. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it will be interesting to observe um, the typology of buildings that will be uh, built, you know, whether there'll be a lot of new big office buildings, for example, in the city, or there'll be more refurbishments, or there'll be buildings being turned from one function to the other, from office to living spaces and things like that. Uh, but I think, you know, that's a kind of very, uh, that's something that is very tangible, but there is also the architectural discourse and philosophical discourse that accompanies a profession, which is something that um, I would hope would benefit from some kind of new energy and new ideas um, about why we do things and who we are and what is our role in that design process, perhaps. Because architects have the possibility to physically change the environment that we occupy, the way that we, you know, navigate through the day, um, which is something yes. that you know, filmmakers can't do that, writers can't do that. Architects have a very real platform for putting their ideas into practice. I think that's true, but I think at the same time, architects are a lot more constrained uh, by rules, laws, regulations, uh, political willingness to do something, you know, strategic level of discourse that, you know, they don't necessarily influence. So, but as you say, I think it's also about this flow of ideas, this kind of fluid, fluid flow of uh, perhaps ideas from one field penetrating into another field and kind of generating a new way of thinking about space or... Yeah, is that what, what we might call intersectionality? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, well, I... but not... It's a tricky one because you know I, I think I think again I think your your initial notion of a monolithic of what we imagine things to be is not quite um, what they are right yeah. so 
I mean, I think architecture is a very kind of well-guarded profession. If, you know, you need certain set of skills to be able to um, draw a plan of a building and you need a very specific kind of education. But at the same time, we shouldn't underestimate the flow of ideas. And it's not necessarily that an artist start designing a building, but, you know, I think there might be an idea that is explored in a work of art that kind of penetrates into a certain kind of um, thinking about architecture. Um, I mean, I think, I think as an observer of the arts institutions, and this is something I've mentioned even in the conversation with Lisa, was that I would, one thing that I'm kind of worried about as an observer is that the institutions will opt for um, these kind of blockbuster exhibitions uh, to draw people in. And, and I think that's perhaps a danger yeah, I mean, I think that's something that we've seen, you know, as a growing tendency over the last 20 years, I guess, as funding becomes more and more problematic. Um, you know, the big institutions in particular are forced to make decisions about programming that, you know, are, are driven by the need to generate income. Um, and, and that's fine, as long as there's also space for the other type of project. Um, you know, so for every Kusama infinity room, you, you need to have your kind of challenging young artist project where someone's really kind of given a platform to do, do something unexpected. Um, so as long as it doesn't become a monoculture, I think it's fine. And you know, it's like the cinema. You know, for every James Bond film, you need to have some kind of extraordinary independent production that's doing something you've never seen before. Uh, that's that's what makes for a rich culture, a rich cultural landscape. Shouldn't there be a, a Nancy Holt retrospective at the Tate? Shouldn't there be? Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> and I really. Well, there, there should be a big Nancy Holt uh, exhibition in London. Um, but there, there should be many big Nancy Holt exhibitions. It's a kind of long... Around the world. Thing, yeah. Um, can, you, can we reflect on that uh, central piece and maybe then we can... Uh, I, I am interested in that relationship that you've established with Nancy Holt. But maybe we can start by talking about uh, an exhibition at your gallery uh, end of last year, just before this third lockdown, and that central piece. I, I'd quite like to hear your reflection because I've now reflected on that central piece, the conversational piece, uh, with a few people, and so it might be nice to kind of understand your reading of it. Well, you know. perhaps I should try and describe it because, uh, of course, there may be people who are listening to this who didn't see it. So the, the work that we're talking about is called Points of View. And it was a, something that Nancy made in 1974 for um, a project space in New York called the Clock Tower. And she basically filmed uh, the view through the four windows of the Clock Tower out across the, the kind of urban landscape of New York. And then she showed those films to four pairs of people and asked them to talk about what they thought they were looking at. Um, so it becomes, I, it, it's a very, very complex, I mean, it's kind of simple on one level, but it's very, very complex on another. Because you can look at the film, you can also go through the process that the the participants are going for you. You can look at these four films, which are grainy black and white video footage, and you know it's quite difficult to kind of pass what it is, what the images are. Um, so, and then you can listen to these people talking about, about it. 
So on, the, on one level, you're very much kind of implicated in the process, you become a participant. But on the second, uh, in another way, you're at one remove, as the artist was, kind of observing this process, observing the process of observation. Um, mm -hmm. So in that sense, it sort of becomes a work about how we understand the process of looking and seeing a perception. Um, and these are kind of really fundamental ideas in Nancy Holt's practice. Uh, and it seems to me that the point of view is a really pivotal work for her. Um, because if you think about the four viewpoints, you know, that, that's then reflected in, of course, her most famous work, the Sun Tunnels, which has these four great sort of viewing devices through which one perceives the landscape. So this point of view sort of foreshadows lots of things that come in her work later and actually sort of picks up on some ideas that she had been working with previously and sort of amplifies them. Uh, and it was a really, you know, making the exhibition was a fascinating process. Um, and we worked very closely with Lisa, the firm from the Holmes Smithson Foundation, to think through, um, you know, questions about authenticity, you know. Could we have shown those films on pleasant screens? Would that have kind of changed the way you understand the work? Yes, it probably would. So we kind of sourced vintage monitors to use. And then there were questions about the audio, you know. It, you you have an established you had an established relationship with Nancy Holt. Yeah, so I was I was really lucky. I got to know her um, and did a big show with her first show in two thousand and twelve, um, and yeah, kind of got to know her pretty well and travelled with her a little bit. And um, she was a really extraordinary person, um, a, a great artist, I think. And, you know, it's been, the last 10 years, it's been one of my kind of key projects has been trying to open up and be an advocate for Nancy's work and for kind of seeing her really in the position she should be seen in. Mm. Um, you know, it, it seems to me that there's a historical uh, imbalance there, you know, when Tate or MoMA or whichever museum it is does a big show about, I don't know, conceptual photography or art and landscape in the 70s or whatever it is, and Nancy Holt's not there, that's like, how can that happen? Um, and it feels like, I think that's changing actually, because when, when we started that first exhibition, we did, I had, I had lots of conversations and it was all about, Oh, Nancy Holt, oh, she's Robert Smithson's widow. And now, you know, we have, I, I talk to people and Smithson's not even in the conversation because we're talking about Nancy Holt. So that the awareness of her work is, is growing and, you know, the Holt Smithson Foundation is doing fantastic work, yeah. super proactive, uh, great team. And, you know, it's, it's, an, it's a really exciting moment for, for anyone who's interested in her work, you know, that's yeah. like, there are going to be more opportunities to see it in the, in the coming years. I really do hope so. Um, and just, I, I, I think just on that, um, on that sculpt, sculptural conversational piece, have you ever spoken to her about it? Um, no, I, sadly I never had an opportunity to just discuss that particular piece with her. But what I can say is that I, Nancy was very interested in other people. Um, you know, she was, she was a great listener. She, she loved to hear what other people thought about things, what, they, what was their take on something. And she had very wide ranging friendships, um, you know, that weren't confined to what we're calling the art world. <laughs> You know, she was really, as for example, she was really, in later life, she became very, very interested in Buddhism and had, um, you know, very kind of rich engagement with various 
people in the US who are involved in promoting uh, meditation and things like that. Mm. So, so I think points of view and the conversations that that work generated, you know, that, that to me feels like a very interesting reflection of her personality. You know, setting something up, setting up a conversation and being the observer, um, being interested in what other people have to kind of bring to the table. Um, you know, and that's a, that's a really rare quality uh, to be a good listener. Uh, and I, I think with your this project that you're doing is a kind of uh, I try. It's a really, it's a it's a really nice. It's mm. it's wonderful that you offer a platform like this and you mm. set up a conversation. Um, I think it's it's really it's you know I'm I'm a participant now instead of an observer. But it's really it's an exciting thing that you're doing. I think. But it was it was interesting when I when I realised. Um, when I kind of made a connection to the Nancy Holt piece, that something I hadn't thought about before I started this project. Yeah. And it was a really nice thing to maybe now keep in mind as maybe subconsciously where the idea came from in November or whenever I saw that piece before lockdown, because I think partially this urge for conversation also came from just the fact that, you know, lockdown after lockdown, yeah. It was a bit of a difficult, um, difficult time. Um, so there is that relation with Nancy Holt. I mean, I think another, and that this is what I was hinting at earlier when I was when I was trying to ask, how do you, once you're interested in something, how do you then um, go about that interest? And another of those relationships that I also enjoyed learning about from your book is the one with Richard Long. Um, and, and I think perhaps with him, because he is kind of rooted in this cultural environment uh, in this country, there is a different kind of relationship. My, my relationship with Richard was very, it was, it was very professional. Um, you know, so when I left the tapes to go to Haunt of Venison, it was prim the primary focus of that was to be was to work with Richard to be his artist manager, as it's called. Um, and, and that meant, you know, doing anything from kind of helping organize uh, travel plans um, to be, be giving kind of very kind of practical admin support to museum exhibitions that were happening, uh, but also kind of engaging in interesting conversations about the work and, you know, Helping with installations and things like that. So, um, you know, and I, I really, really enjoyed working with him. He's a, he's a great artist, um, a really interesting person to spend time with. And you know, because I used to be a a, a mountain climber, you know, we, we were always able to kind of talk about you know different mountains. Rocks. Yeah, rocks. <laughs> that, that's a lot. Um, you know, but it was kind of you know very much a sort of practical relationship that I that I had with him. Um, and yeah, you know, going back to childhood and being interested in you know, Rick Richard always says said actually that um, you know there's a quote in one of his interviews where he talks about the fact that you know as a child he used to enjoy mucking around uh, on the banks of the, of, of the Avon, splashing around in the mud and stuff. And as an artist, it, that's what he does now. You know, it's, it's just kind of, he found a way to, to kind of make art from the things that he discovered and was passionate about, about as a young man, as a boy, you know, walking in the landscape, uh, playing in the mud. You know, it's, it's quite re remarkable how he's how, how he's been able to make that an art form. Uh, yeah. wonderful. So I, I think I, I sort of saw that and felt very connected to it, I guess. Um, 
But it manifests, I think that relationship manifests in a, in a series of your own works, which I'd say are also kind of creative work. The, the, the essays you've written, the conversations you've had with them. Yeah. You know, I think, I think the relationship has resulted in, in somehow in your own um, creativity in some way. Well, so I, I think, you know, one of the wonderful things about working with artists in this context, as opposed to the museum context, is that the relationships tend to be ongoing and longer term. You know, when you curate a museum show with an artist, there's this kind of really profound and intense involvement. And then the show opens and it kind of, <laughs> you, you move on to the next project. Um, Whereas, you know, the, in this present situation that I'm in, you know, this is a kind of, can be an ongoing thing. So, you know, I worked with Richard very closely for, what, I guess, seven years. Um, and during that time, you know, he did lots of exhibitions. I wasn't involved in all of them, but I was quite involved in, in a fair few of them. Um, and it's like with Nancy, you know, now, um, you know, I've been working with her for more than a decade now. It's kind of, so what that allows is you do, I think you can, there's the possibility of really kind of starting to understand someone and their work. Um, and, uh, and I guess, I hope hopefully, you know, the, some of the essays have, have reflected that a little bit. Um, but there is a, in curation, there is a kind of voyeuristic uh, element of kind of interest in other person's life. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I guess it's natural, isn't it? When you work so closely with someone, you know, it can, you know, it can go, part, go beyond the work, you know, and become, it might become a friendship. Um, it might not, you know, it, it, it's different every time, but it's a natural impulse, isn't it? If you, if you yeah. love a work of art, you, you're, you kind of want to know who made it and why they made it. Um, and so as if you're in a kind of ongoing working relationship with someone, you know, just in the course of conversation, then, you know, you insights, arrive um, and as you sort of start to see someone's personality emerge that also colors the way that you see the work um, so which one comes first does is it the work or the artist when you when you approach that thing i don't know whether so, so it's 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 interesting because I, I don't know which one do you approach the art or the artist which one um, yeah, interesting question. I, I think the artwork, I think the, the, the art is the kind of portal. Um, you know, if, it's, if it affects you, if it kind of, if it's working its magic on you, then that's the thing that then it's like, well, you know, like, like I just said, it's like, well, who made this? And why did they do it? What, what were they thinking about when they made it? And why is that having this effect on me? You know, be it, you know, it might just be visual pleasure, or it might be something a bit more kind of knotty and complex. That's kind of something I can't get out of my head. You know, why, why is that happening? Um, and, so, and sometimes it's fine just to kind of leave it at that, but when there's an opportunity to go in a bit deeper, then, you know, it's kind of hard to resist. Yeah. You know, but I mean, I'm just wondering whether that would, that would mean that you would become, that you would sometimes maybe be disappointed or you have as a curator to have such kind of sense of openness that you never get disappointed if the art object is something that you admire. That's interesting. I, I can't. I can't really think of a moment where, you know, I've found the work fascinating, and then I've 
met the artist and it's been like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> only if it will happen. But I, I mean, it, it must happen because um, I'm sure there's some really uninteresting artists out there, but you know, it's, um, yeah, so that's maybe, a curious question. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, how interesting, because then maybe maybe your relationships to the work would then automatically change. Maybe then you would revisit your fascination with the work once you... I think it's true that once you, you can have a very pure re relationship between between the, the observer and the artwork, you know, that can be a very kind of pure and direct thing. And then once you've met the artist, you, you can never unmeet the artist. You know, they're, 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 that's always going to somehow have a bearing on that, that previously very kind of pure and direct relationship with the artwork. Um, I mean, usually it kind of it enhances it because you see more, you understand more. Um, yeah, curious. Right. Um, it, it must be interesting, you know, if you're a curator working on um, his, you know, his artists from from the past, and you, there's never the opportunity to actually to meet. But then I suppose that you know, perhaps there's, there's access to let's say letters or journals or something, and maybe that's the kind of that's the connection. So just, I think I'll, I have a few questions to maybe conclude. And that is to, again, maybe just reflect on land art as um, something that in this current moment in time is both controversial because of some practices from the past, let's say, where you know chemicals have been used and yeah. or or that kind of machoism of grandeur that um, we see in some deserts in America and the maybe a land art that could be an instrument for some kind of higher consciousness or awareness of our natural environment, uh, climate, geography, and things. So, so could you weigh those two things? And, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think you're right to say that there's some aspects of it are very controversial. It, you, you, could, you couldn't really imagine some of those kind of monumental earthworks from these kind of 60s and 70s. I just don't think they could be made now, really. I mean, it's just um, because we're, you know, in, in the intervening decades, there is this kind of growing consciousness of the planet as this kind of fragile place that needs to be really kind of treated with care. <clears throat> um, but that doesn't mean, you know, that doesn't sort of, retrospectively devalue those works, I don't think. You know, I think that it's really important and extraordinary works that we can look back at and learn from. Um, and, you know, it, I think it's really interesting, you know, Tom mentioned in the conversation about the climate crisis and the growing environmental awareness. And it's clearly, it's one of the kind of big big questions of our time. And there are lots of artists who are interested in addressing um, the, the, these ideas. Um, you know, land art in a way is a kind of very, is a broad umbrella under which there are lots of different kinds of land art. Um, and, you know, environmental and ecological art is, is one of those, I guess. Uh, and there's some really great work being made, but there's also some quite uninteresting work being made, I think. Uh, I mean, it's my, it's my personal taste, but I, 
I don't respond particularly to work that has a very kind of is seeking to kind of articulate a political message or which is perhaps um, trying to put forward solutions or uh, you know for me I mean that, that, it's valid but it's, it's just kind of doesn't work for me in the same way that something that's perhaps more um, uh, you know, a bit kind of more oblique and uh, strange than it's but it's all, all of this is in, it's all kind of contributing to a growing awareness so it, it, it's important um, yeah yeah and um, I think another kind of element of the present moment is something that I suppose in land art has been a very important device and that is the camera, yeah. the photography, right? Um, and our relationship to camera and photography is changing. We know on, very, on many levels with social media, with, I mean, we can go into CCTV, or, um, but, but on that point about the importance of photography in land art, why? Why is it important? Is it to document something that uh, has an uncertain future or an uncertain behavior in a particular environment? Or are these two techniques somehow connected on some other level that is less, well, obvious? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, you know, I think photography historically played a really important role in the development of land art because often works were made in obscure or hard to reach places so so the document in a way becomes a sort of surrogate for the actual thing um, but i i wonder if there is something even that, that, that's, that's more fundamental than that and perhaps Nancy Holt's work offers us a way of thinking about that. Um, you know, given her interest in these viewing devices, this kind of engagement with perception, um, you know, is are the sun tunnels just really giant primitive cameras? In fact, um, so yeah, I think I think there's something a bit more kind of knottily kind of tangled up there that. Um, you know, I'm probably not very well equipped to try and <laughs> un untangle at this at this moment. But um, yeah, ca I mean, cameras are such curious things, and photographs. Uh, you know, so much has been written about the kind of strangeness. Of yeah, I guess there's a whole notion of time. Yeah. Of of yeah, not not just duration, but time. Yeah. Yeah, and then, so in the book I, you know, I wrote about this British artist called Roger Acklin, who, um, you know, he's not, he's not a land artist, but he's someone whose practice was very connected in very interesting ways to, to what we might call land art. And he, his work was made by focusing the light of the sun through a handheld lens in order to burn marks onto pieces of wood that he found on the shore or you know on, in the landscape where he was working and so there's, there's something inherently photographic about that practice as well even though you know there's no print there's still this sense of a framing device that then sort of creates an effect um, so, yeah, kind of again and again, this sort of this tang tangled, tangledness kind of comes up again. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as I'm sort of thinking out loud, I'm thinking about other artists where you know, the, the aspects of the practice kind of reflect on the photographic without actually being photographic. It's, um, what artist? 
thinking about so Ju Julian Charrier, the, another a younger artist that I wrote about in the book, and there's a wonderful series that he made of the uh, the islands in the Pacific where the nuclear tests were were uh, in the fifties, and on the one hand they are kind of quite they are photographs of landscapes, but then he has kind of uh, brought radioactive material into contact with the photographic film and that has then disrupted the photographic image. So you have, you have a kind of element from a landscape that is bending and corrupting the image. So, yeah. I, I, it's that is brilliant. That is so, so amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then wow. someone like um, Gary Fabian Miller in his Dark Room on Dartmoor, you know, he is a photographic artist, but he, mm. you know, he doesn't use a camera to make his photographs. So, and there's something of the landscape that somehow kind of permeates the studio and somehow sort of is there in the in the work, even though it's not 